Kia ora and welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. My name is Patrick Smelly and I'm the editor at Business Desk. We have a great Business Desk special for listeners and viewers. You can find out about that at the end of this episode. Before we get started though, here's some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Today we're joined by the Chief Executive and Principal Economist at Infometrics, Brad Olson, to talk about the economy. Welcome, Brad. Thanks for having me. Good fun. Well, we learned last week that we're in the world's tiniest recession. Uh, so uh, talk to us a bit about what kind of recession this is, how to think about it, uh, it's, it's as, a, as a retail investor. It's an interesting one because I think, I mean, we get hung up a lot on the word recession. And I've seen, I think it was Arthur Grimes last week who sort of said, anyone who's calling this an actual recession is either sort of uh, stupid or or, um, or lazy. Uh, and, and I thought it was an interesting sort of comment. And the general sort of consensus seems to be that we have this technical de- uh, re- definition of a recession, two quarters of negative growth. Uh, but until you start to see that pain in the economy, perhaps it's not a real recession or it certainly doesn't feel as real to households. Holds. Now, unpacking that a bit more, when you look at the latest economic figures, GDP fell, uh, fell 0.06%, so that was rounded to a 0.1% drop, comes after a, a revised 0.7% drop at the end of uh, last year. So yes, two negative quarters in a row. You look at levels of economic activity though, and they're still above where they were in mid-2022 or so. So you, know, you look at economic momentum and you say, they're not going... Uh, as frantic as the start, as the middle of last year, but also they're not. Uh, you know, we haven't moved down to 30 k's now from 100. We've sort of gone from maybe 105 down to the speed limit of 100, a little bit more. Um, also, I think the big one, and, and this is where investors will be more interested, and in what's driving that shift. And one of the parts that we picked up on was the fall in spending over the last year. Uh, so overall spending by households was down 0.2 percent year on year. Apart from lockdowns, that's the largest drop in spending since 2009. Looking into the details, you have a look uh, at the likes of durable spending, so those larger big ticket items. Uh, they've fallen 11% over the last year, the largest drop since 1990. Uh, non-durable, so more consumable, quick fire, you know, supermarket items and that, often more essential items as well. Uh, they fell, uh, I think, 6%. That's the largest fall on record going back to 1988. So it does sort of seem to be a little bit of, when you look at the underlying figures, you really get the feeling that that inflation means less bang for buck, that the economy isn't moving ahead at quite the same pace. But realistically, at a a headline level, really the economy has just dropped back in speed a touch more towards where the speed limit is rather than sort of roaring away. And so a bit more balance, I think, between the two positions. It sounds a little bit, though, as if if, if, a 6% drop in in household spending, that's that's huge. It it is quite a big drop. What's that reflecting in terms of what what are people people not eating? Uh, What what are they spending that money on instead? Because that's not as if people aren't continuing to earn what they did. That's absolutely true and I think what we're starting to see is that sort of through parts of last year you were seeing a lot more that households were reacting to inflation. At a headline level they were still spending more and more dollars uh, but they were getting less for that as inflation eroded away. But they were still spending more overall and that said that like you say they've been earning more money as well and obviously those interest rate increases hadn't fully hit them. They've now very much started to and actually look I mean the other challenge with GDP right is that it's so sort of long toothed you know it happened three months ago the world has moved on a lot from then. But confirming that sort of trend around where households are sitting, and this goes to your question of what are people spending differently on, what we saw was that card spending, electronic card spending in the month of May fell for the first time since February. Now February was a bit of a cyclone effect, understandable. May was very much starting to see for the first time that households really are being hit by those interest rate increases because everyone uh, prioritises the essentials. You pay your mortgage first, then you put food on the table and fuel in the car. Everything else sort of comes after that. And so when we looked at those card spending figures, for example, we saw a 0.3% fall in consumables, so and that's often your essentials around supermarket foods. You saw a 0.8% fall in durables, so again, your larger big ticket items. And then you saw a much larger fall in the likes of apparel, so shoes and clothing and similar, which is is not the first thing you think of you desperately need each and every day. You can sort of let your fashion uh, get a little bit more out of date. So I think what you're seeing there, particularly for consumers, uh, is that consumer confidence is low business 
business confidence is low, people are now making a much more defined effort on what are they putting their money towards. And that means that that stuff that is essential, electricity, fuel, uh, the likes of food and similar, that will still always command a market. A little bit softer, but always commands a market. All the other stuff that is a bit more discretionary uh, doesn't need to be spent on as quickly. You can delay those purchases for a while. I think that's going to be a little bit harder to come by sales-wise this year. So where do you think we are in this in this cycle, if in fact it's a cycle? Uh, it does feel to me as if a lot of households have yet really to, to mortgaged households, people who hold debt, have yet to see the full impact of, of much higher interest rates. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, as you say, all, all of that, that small fall in economic activity has already happened. Are we, you know, where are we in the, in, the, in the move through what presumably is eventually a return to a, some kind of recovery? Yeah, I think, I mean, looking at, through it, I think there's still a lot of uh, that sort of latent level of, of weakness or at least sort of more stagnation in, in economic activity. I, I don't necessarily think we're going to see uh, further large falls in economic activity through the year because you've got parts of the economy that are moving ahead better and other parts that are pulling back. And, and you know, you look at the likes of construction, for example, a lot of work being done now, not as much that will be done uh, in the next year or so as the residential market pulls back. Again, that retail activity pulling back. Back, uh, a little bit um, but you're seeing other areas as well tourism for example has gone from nothing to something um, that, and that sort of level of, of growth is coming back forward for a lot of households we know that still about half of them have to refix their mortgages at some point this year they'll be taking a bit of a sigh of relief by uh, the Reserve Bank saying look we think we're done with interest rate rises uh, in recent weeks so you have seen borrowing costs that have uh, uh, increased more for banks and so retail banks have put up their interest rates uh, for retail uh, uh, sort of uh, mortgages and similar but I think that sort of tone for the rest of the year is sort of we're going to be sitting on our hands effectively you know so, the economy so, so, has been trying to jump up. So it sounds like you know not a great time for the warehouse not a great time for Helen Science Glassons but maybe a, 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 pit, a fine old time for electricity companies uh, uh, you know which sectors are likely are there any sectors here which will thrive through this period? Yeah I mean I Does think. anybody actually benefit from recession? Well I mean it's one of those things I don't know if anyone necessarily benefits but there are certainly those that probably don't get hit as much and you're right I mean electricity for example is, is you always need it right and increasingly at the moment we're actually seeing a much higher level of demand for electricity as we decarbonise um, information has just done some analysis, there's $4 billion more investment into electricity lines distribution over the next eight years or so compared to previous forecasts because everyone's now in that sort of uh, investment mode. I mean, I think as well there are opportunities out there. You look at some of the uh, more recent raises of, of capital, you know, um, the likes of the Infratil one was, was far oversubscribed. I know people that got 10% of what they asked for as retail investors. So I, I think there's uh, people who are looking for opportunities and you look at some of those other options in, in the retail space, I think a big part of this year is going to be uh, how do you convince your shoppers that your uh, business, that your that the spending you're trying to get is important. You know, if the pie is smaller, you've got to fight a lot more for that uh, slice of the pie. Put it this way, I don't think no one's going to go and buy any pants a at any point this year. It's just that maybe instead of buying three lots of pants, they're going to buy two, and you've got to make sure that your shop is the one selling those two lots of pants to people. Sure, sure. Which which economic indicators will you be watching most closely? Um, you know, there, there's a, particularly if you're thinking for, with a retail investor mindset, because uh, there's you know a, a million different things you could look at. You know, there must be a few because I know the Brad, the Brad Olson uh, <laughs> approach to economic uh, indicators is to have some fairly odd ones up your sleeve, your sleeve anyway. Yeah, you always try to. I mean, look, I do think the electronic cards one is, is a useful one. It just gives you a very clear and immediate read on, on what spending uh, is, is doing. And I think that tells you a little bit about consumer confidence as well. Look, if I've got money in my wallet and I'm not getting it out, it's obviously because I'm not keen to spend it. I think I've got other stuff to spend on. If I am still spending it, then obviously I think I've got enough to be able to go out and do something with it. So that's sort of a, a, an immediate one. There's all sorts of weird and wonderful indicators, particularly around recession time, if you will, that come through. I mean, I've heard of the cardboard box index, there's the lipstick index which I quite enjoy uh, apparently and, and this is the thing, we talk about these, no one's ever actually given me a nice chart of any of these but yes. the lipstick index I think is the idea that when economic times become tougher people who often uh, buy makeup don't have as much money for makeup, in 
so if there's one thing that will apparently do a lot to your look it's it's a dash of lipstick rather than everything else uh, look i have no idea personally so what, but what more lipstick sales well well this is the thing though right is is it more lipstick sales or is it more lipstick relative to i don't know all your other sort of makeup and right, similar right. um i mean there's 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 all sorts of uh weird and wild ones out there i do think there are some nice core economic indicators that you always look at uh though i mean you've also um got the likes of uh every month we we look at um like i say that those electronic card figures the gdp figures are somewhat important probably one of the ones we're looking at a lot closer are monthly job numbers that come out from stats nz you can break those down by industry so you get a bit of a feel for again where that hiring momentum is um all the classics what's, what's and similar. well and, and that's sort of the one that, that i think shows a bit of a two-speed economy at the moment or at least a lagged effect at the moment you've seen quite a lot of jobs being added over the first three months four months of the year um 2.3 percent growth for just the first four months that's the sort of growth figure you'd be excited about over a year and we got it just in four months mm. but job ad numbers so intentions to hire further have pulled back quite a bit and so i think it sort of shows that businesses at the moment are looking at the employment market and going i've been able to hire some people more recently as migration has gone up but i don't know if i'm going to need as many through the second half of this year so maybe a little bit of a build up of steam now a little bit less coming through so one you've got to look at the indicators two you've got to sort of interpret them in the wider mix of every other bit of data coming through well how, how much do you think the i mean when i look at the consumer sentiment and the business sentiment surveys that are either patchy or, or bleak um to what extent is it possible that we're just talking ourselves into this? I mean, you're talking about a, a shallow recession with the likelihood of, of uh, interest rates falling maybe by the end of next year. Um, you know, I'd have thought there must be buying opportunities starting to emerge in, a, in this kind of environment where most people are feeling glum. Yeah, but but anybody looking forward and over the horizon might be might be saying, well, now is you know, are we at a turning point sometime soon? Absolutely, and I think as well, you know, it, it's the sort of thing that the consumer confidence and business confidence they always seem to be a lot worse than actual reality. And certainly, I mean, business confidence is interesting. If you ask businesses generally how they think the economy is going to do over the next year uh, versus how they think their own business is going to do, everyone's a lot more optimistic about their own business and less optimistic about the general economy. And that, that's always sort of a persistent gap. Um, I think as well for a lot of people it depends on, on, on who you are and where you are in your life stage. Um, you know, someone who bought a house in the in the last year or so who's having to pay a lot more on their mortgage, probably not as many opportunities uh, out there. People who have got some money in, in, in savings or, or who are still renting probably have a little bit more manoeuvrability. Um, you know, if you bought a house uh, in March 2022, uh, you're having to find an extra $13,000 this year, whereas a renter is, is having to find less than that. So there are, I think, some opportunities out there for people who are looking. Um, but it does come down a lot to uh, when you think those changes are going to appear in the market and I guess how bullshy you are, how, how willing are you to sort of um, go forward because I think at the moment um, there's there's one thing of sort of sitting on your hands if you will as an economy and there's another like you say to drive it down deeper I mean mm. let's be clear, the Reserve Bank told us they were trying to get a recession, bullseye they got it, absolutely yeah. um, but I don't think that has to be a GFC 2.0 or anything like that, it does just have to be that lower level of economic activity I think sort of as this year progresses, uh, people, like you say, will be looking for more opportunities and it will be a lot more, I think, uh, pick a path for a lot of people where they're mm. looking at, you know, what are those various drivers, what industries are going to come forward. I mean, tech, for example, has been shedding staff, there's lower spending in that sort of area, so I think people are a little bit more reluctant. But equally, we know that there are developments over time, we can only pull so many things out of the ground, whereas those weightless exports, especially for New Zealand, have big op opportunities. So I think, you know, people are doing a little bit of home we'll see that there are still opportunities out there you just got to have your wits about you so when when will we know that we're on the mend i mean i, I look at things like um an expectation that interest rates have peaked and a lot of chat about house prices having finished their their uh relative plummet of the last 18 months or so i mean doesn't that indicate if those two things start to cohere uh, how, how might that transfer through into sentiment uh, into opportunities and equities that sort of thing yeah I mean there's definitely part of it that and especially the migration boost that we're seeing come through at the moment the fact that the labour market is still strong I mean you know we're expecting to see the unemployment rate rise a touch but in historical terms it's still going to be at a better level not a great level but a better level than a lot of other times um, I think for a, quite a few people it's probably still another three to six months before you really get that feeling of exactly where the economy is sitting um, and that's in fact where we think the Reserve Bank's probably sitting as well I mean those guys are trying to figure out where the economy uh, is 
is going as well. Uh, and certainly in our mind, um, there's not a lot of data that you get between now and November that would definitively tell you if you think you're on a better path. There's well, sort of a little the bit biggest of piece down. of data we'll get is an election result. How important is that? Do you think to, well, to sentiment? I mean, I mean, you 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 know as well as I do that I, f- I feel like political parties sort of you know promise the earth and then get in and, and there's not as much of an ability to make those changes immediately. And I sort of say that, but I think that probably in terms of um, you know what happens in the election, there's probably almost a period where, that we're entering now until October where people uh, again don't do as much, they sort of settle down a little bit waiting for the election result to come through, more because there might be different opportunities that come through depending on who's in power and what policies actually make it through. Um, I think the housing one is probably an area that people are a lot more focused on, there are quite different options on the table depending on the government that could be formed uh, after October, but I think as well, I mean let's not forget some of the other core economic challenges, I mean inflation is still high, food price inflation was 12.1% in the month of May, I mean slightly better than 12 Point five, but still around what it was when we introduced GST back in the uh, in the late eighties. So I think for a lot of households, again, um, there are people who are going to be struggling with some of the essentials. There's others that'll be looking for opportunities, and I think probably the risk profile at the moment is moving into a position where previously you couldn't see the top. You had no idea when interest rate rises were going to end. There was just huge levels of challenge. Whereas now I think people are seeing, okay, the Reserve Bank has stopped, the Federal Reserve has taken a pause. Maybe maybe there is more opportunity. To starting to enter and maybe as that sort of level of competition heats up in the market because you're having to work harder for the sales that are coming through maybe that does provide a bit more opportunity particularly if you can see some strong leadership in an industry or a sector uh, where they are sort of looking at how you move forward how you bring consumers along with you how you extract that dollar I mean when you're investing in a business you want that business to succeed if there's not someone who's pushing a business to succeed it probably doesn't have a great shelf life. What do you think the uh, the mindset of an of an investor or a saver might be at the moment? I mean, <clears throat> if you're a if you're a cashed up person or have some money to invest, uh, the change from like a one percent term deposit rate for a couple of years to six percent plus is a, is an extraordinary improvement. It may not be quite keeping up with inflation, but it's an extraordinary improvement on where we've been. Well, and also better than a lot of other investment options, right? You put your money into a house at the moment, it's going down. Not yes. as much, but it's still going down. And even the stock market is sort of not in the in the most perfect position where previously it was just sort of rocketing upwards. I think that term deposit one is an area where I think increasingly people through the pandemic have had a lot of challenges right in front of them. And that's, I think, uh, spurred a bit of hesitancy. You've seen with the cyclones recently as well, a real focus uh, around resilience. I think for a lot of people that probably says, look, if there is a good term deposit rate, maybe you sort of put a bit in. That's your emergency fund and sort of the thing you do first. And then afterwards, though, you don't you don't put all of it in there. You're still looking for those opportunities over the longer term. That's, I think, a focus area for a lot of but investors. But that, that infratool, recent infratool capital raise, really interesting to see people piling into quite the extent that they did. What do you think uh, made that attractive? Given that, given that it's probably not returning that much more and has more risk attached than uh, than a, a you know a well priced term deposit rate. I think for a lot of people there probably is a little bit of patriotism in, in, in there, you know it's a New Zealand company and, and similar that they were um, investing in with One New Zealand, um, but also I think the technological advances that are coming through, uh, again there are big opportunities there, you know, um, thinking about getting into sort of you know satellite connectivity, but more broadly as well, I mean you, you look at some of those areas where there have been greater investments in you know data farms and, and data warehouses and uh, renewable energy and similar um, over time, I, I think there's sort of a, still a, a focus on that probably not as uh, much as as sort of in 21 and 22 when there was a real green focus if you will but now seems to have a a slightly um, I think people are pursuing that sort of uh, more broad strategy and where they can sort of buy into something that they've heard a lot about they know a lot about it's a little bit closer to home they understand the conditions a bit more I think that's where people's comfort levels probably sit yeah do you think do you think business cycles exist anymore if they're if they if they do are we in a cycle at this stage? Where are we in it? I think there probably are business cycles, but I think business cycles, uh, you know, get knocked off their bike, uh, if, if you will excuse the poor pun, by the likes of weather events, by pandemics and, and similar. So, I mean, there's there's some natural business cycles, there's some sort of outside induced challenges as well. I think for a, a lot of businesses, though, one of the things that seems um, difficult at the moment is that margins have been crimped by high inflation and similar. There has been a bit of catch-up and, and, and what have you that's been provided. But I think a lot of people now are in that sort of low period, uh, given interest rates have been high, and going, look, I'm still looking to grow, but for the next 
next year or so, I might be not only capacity constrained, but sort of sales constrained. What's the role of the banks in this recession? It, they, you know, they do seem very cautious, particularly on business lending. Uh, at what point might we see a little less caution uh, in that sector, do you think? I think there's a few challenges that come through in terms of, look, I think banks should be um, a lot more sort of proactive in getting out there. I think they are a lot more reserved though. I mean, part of it is that they've got to hold higher capital over time. That means that they've sort of got a bit of an aversion to, to being too uh, forthright on the lending front and also to sort of bring in those bigger profits and, and keep themselves capitalised. On the housing front, I mean, let's be real, they've made billions of dollars in profits over time. If they then start turfing out New Zealanders who are struggling to make their mortgage repayments and similar, they are going to lose their social licence faster than anything. And I think it says that over the year, as there are more people that become stressed, and, and we're seeing that already, I think that has to be a focus for the banks, that they have to be willing to sort of stand up and find some ways through. Um, at the same time, I think the business lending is an interesting one, particularly, I mean, let's talk post-cyclone for a minute, because there's been some big changes around there and it seems like you've sort of got that Spider-Man uh, meme of, of everyone pointing at each other. You've got the government pointing at insurers, you've got the insurers pointing at banks, you've got the banks pointing at the government and, and uh, vice versa sort of saying it's your responsibility. Now I think it's one of those interesting ones where the banks are, are probably holding back a little bit more um, in terms of letting investors, uh, sorry insurers and the government decide on, on what needs to happen next but banks have a big vested interest in this. You know they've got money behind these businesses, they want to see them uh, progress. I think that's probably the, the mindset shift that has to come through over the rest of this year is you've got to take a bit of a punt on some of these businesses. I mean, there are opportunities out there. If you can make a business case work, then perhaps during a, a, a slightly less frantic economic time is the time that you sort of lay the groundwork as a business for getting ready that when there are better sales conditions, you're ready to go, you run out there and you go and grab them. So I think there does have to be sort of more willingness on that investment front. Um, the question is, I guess, not only where that risk appetite lies for banks, but, but what are they looking for? What, what do you need to prove to your bank these days that you're going to get through? Because over the last few years, coming up with a certain expectation of you know uh, the sort of sales that might come through in a, in a higher interest rate environment, that's difficult. And it's going to remain difficult for a wee while. But I guess the, the, the question is, can the bank sort of see that future pathway for businesses and extend to them not only just a bit of working capital, but actually sort of some upfront support to get businesses from that sort of smaller enterprise model to a slightly bigger one where they can expand their operations? Because at the moment New Zealand still doesn't seem to be doing enough of that work to get our businesses to a level where they can be you know exporting to the world where we can become more efficient where we get that sort of productivity gains we seem to be sort of happy to play in a much smaller sandpit when there is a you know an upgrade available if we were to buy it. Let's talk a, bit, a little bit for a moment about debt because one of the um sort of memes out there, it's almost a political rather than a rather than an economic discussion, is, is New Zealand too indebted? There's a lot of concern about how much the government created in terms of new debt during COVID, uh, a sense that the country is, is uh, overly indebted and yet uh, apart from the balance of payments uh, deficit, which definitely shows a high level of private indebtedness, there's not much to suggest that our fiscal settings are, are particularly unusual or even particularly bad. Can you just unpick all that a, bit, a little bit for us? To yeah. know, what should we worry about? What should we not worry about? I mean, I think it's one of those things, certainly on the government debt side, you know, are we overly or are we too indebted? No, you know, we haven't had a credit downgrade or anything like that because of government finances. Um, when you look at sort of debt to GDP uh, for New Zealand, we look in a much better position than a lot of other parts of the world. We're at sort of 30 to 40 percent, depending on the metric you're using. Um, the US and the UK are over 100, Japan's at 200, maybe 300 by now, you know, they're, they're in some big indebted positions. Um, equally, New Zealand seems to get hit with, with big natural disasters a lot more frequently and again we're a small nation we don't have as much of an ability uh, to sort of pay all that much more we don't have 300 million consumers uh, like the US does for example so yeah. I think we always have to keep that one in mind um, but we've also got to invest for the rainy day before the flood comes I mean the cyclone showed us that pretty pretty strongly so the investment for example by the government in infrastructure 71 billion dollars uh, this year uh, over the next few years plus six billion additional to that for resilience all of that is important. Um, I think as well though that you look at uh, over time, um, New Zealand is, is not assessing uh, where we put our money quite as well. We're not always looking for that bang for buck. Um, the current account balance is probably the part that we look at the most with concern because it does show that we're spending a lot more uh, than we're earning when it comes to the global stage. That means that um, 
the indebtedness is sort of not as much of an issue of if the global economy goes into a, a sharper economic downturn, we're a lot more exposed to that. It means that we won't be able to resource our economy as much. It also means that if our exports are already doing not as well as we'd want, then they certainly won't get any better. And I think that's probably the challenge for the economic outlook is that for a long time, New Zealand spent the last few years as the team of 5 million. Um, the team of 5 million now has to compete with a team of 8 billion globally, um, and they are a lot more powerful than, than we will ever be. So I think that sort of global focus has become more important. For households, that level of indebtedness, um, again, I think, you know, broadly speaking, we fi find ourselves comfortable enough. Uh, the Reserve Bank's got good focus on financial stability and similarly at a broad system level. Um, but for some households, you know, they're now paying more than half of the average household income to repay pay a mortgage that doesn't leave a lot for other bits of spending and I think the worry there is again the distributional impacts that starts to happen that's why we're talking a lot more about tax than we ever have done before and, and similar um, but again I don't know if we're having a full enough conversation about what that means for the wider economy and where we're sort of going in five to ten years time we sort of seem to be trapped more politically day to day. But one of the implications of um, having reasonably high levels of debt and uh, potentially a, a weaker international economy is we you almost inevitably get a weaker exchange rate out of that, and that's got to be good news for uh, certain types of exporters and tourism. I mean, again, with a retail investor's hat on, uh, a weak exchange rate, where, where, do you, where do you look for opportunity in that? Oh, the exchange rate one's so difficult though. I mean, I remember last year, um, you know, when we were seeing the exchange rate sort of move in, in, in a heck of a direction against, you know, the New Zealand dollar versus the US, for example. And, and everyone sort of asked, well, well, why are we doing this? And, you know, there were various explanations over, you know, um, the US is taking a stronger stance and, and maybe New Zealand isn't until the end of 2022 and similar. Um, but the level of shift in the exchange rate seemed a lot more hectic than, than could be explained by those sort of factors. So I sort of feel like, and the Reserve Bank's tried this over time, right to try and dictate where the exchange rates move they spent a whole lot of money and still got beaten by the market so yeah. I feel like trying to sort of judge that exchange rate game seems to be quite difficult at the moment and I think people probably have a lot of exposure um, certainly I, I guess that feeling of where our interest rates are going probably dictates it more alongside that debt profile I mean I do want to take it back to debt though for a moment it depends a lot on what we're investing in um, you know because we're hearing uh, from the ratings agencies for example that when it comes to New Zealand's debt uh, you know if we're uh, you know, hold a, a high current account balance for a long time and have no uh, real pathway to improve it, then yeah, we're probably not looking good. Equally, a few years back, they said if you guys in New Zealand don't start to invest some serious money in your infrastructure, the lack of infrastructure investment actually, and, and in effect, lower debt holdings makes you just as vulnerable because it means when something hits you, it's going to go bad. So, which is sort of where we seem to be now, in, know, in, a, in a way. And, and absolutely, you know, one of the one of the things that I keep wondering about, you know, people say that the construction industry will be less busy over the next couple of years. I presume that's home house construction and, and commercial property rather than new substantial public infrastructure. And to what extent and, and where, uh, again, with an investor's hat on, uh, would you expect to see some of the um, <clears throat> economic momentum of the next couple of years coming from what is a very large program, it seems to me, uh, of uh, fiscal stimulus coming ba mainly from either central or local government to build stuff, roads and stormwater and God knows what. Well you're absolutely right in, in terms of how those different parts of the market are working. I mean residential outlook is not good when it comes to house building. Again, ha not good as sort of relative, not good as a relative to 51,000 consents when you know New Zealand can only probably build 35 maybe 40,000 uh, a year. Um, you have seen though that New Zealand that um, house consents have fallen 26% in April so it's been a pretty short sharp pullback and that's because you can't find finance if you're looking to develop a house you know uh, that you're going to be uh, spending 15-20% more to build it you're going to be getting 15% less than you first thought about it but at the same time government regulation means that if you're uh, building a new house you get interest deductibility and you don't have to worry about the bright line test whereas if you're selling an existing house you do so I think there are a few different moving parts there but overall yes we're, we're expecting that that residential market pulls back uh, commercial still seems so Solid enough, you know, hospital buildings, education buildings, and, and the like coming through. Um, still a solid level of business investment, you know, from private sector, not quite as strong as previously, but enough that keeps going on. But you're right, that infrastructure area has a lot of, of work to be done. Um, there's a lot of roads and, and stock banks and water pipes and, and what have you to be invested in. I think the difficulty is going to be a little bit one around the capacity of the sector because there's a lot to do, uh, but 
but not necessarily enough people and materials to do it. Uh, but secondly, I think, is around what what is the prioritisation? I was a little bit perturbed when we uh, were in the budget lockup. We were looking through all the uh, f- glorious budget documents uh, on, on in May, and we saw all this high level of um, investment into infrastructure, which was good. Uh, government's still taking until 2025, though, to decide the priorities. And it sort of says if it's 2025 to decide the priorities, it's another three years to then design the flipping things, and then you go even further and it takes longer to build them. You know, we're, we're in the start of a pathway of probably 10 years worth of infrastructure investment. That's good, but it does take a while. And I think for people, there will be a frustration of how long it takes. You know, a building, a, a house takes nine months to knock mm. up. Um, infrastructure takes a fair bit longer. But for, for an investor's mindset, you'd say anything looks like substantial public infrastructure is probably... Uh, is upside there. Absolutely, and I think particularly when it's in that transport area where, you know, that benefits our uh, supply and logistics sort of operations because they'll be able to move more stuff. It opens up more opportunities in the retail market because there is that sort of av- ability to develop. And when it comes to manufacturing and similar, again, you get those those sort of opportunities. And if you're anywhere near the infrastructure sector, either a provider into or a, or a user of or similar, then yes, there are further developments uh, that come through. And I think, you know, there are a number of New Zealand companies that are operating in that space where there is more investment um, and increasingly we're looking offshore to where are there sort of skills and opportunities that we can bring that sort of stuff in. So it sort of brings us to the immigration question. I mean, I don't think there's anything more surprising to me than the complete turnaround in immigration. Um, how, to, to what, you know, do you think that we are seeing pent up demand that's going to sort of uh, ease off a little bit in the next few months or is, or is this, are we back to where we were pre, pre-COVID which is basically importing large numbers of people to make up for the fact that that uh, people who started off in New Zealand are tending to want to leave. Well, and this is the thing. I mean, we always have a brain drain, right? It's just that normally that brain drain is more than counted for. It does by seem to, th- to me that we've forgotten that we have always had a brain drain. Oh, it's, a, com- it's like a, sl- a new phenomenon. It's completely. Not. And, and well, I think it's also a sort of thing when you have you know those numbers of arrivals coming in that, that go back to very low levels. Um, we saw the the number of New Zealand of people departing from New Zealand as migrants got back to normal, if you will, quite quickly. And so I think mm. the feeling was, why aren't we seeing? And internationals do the same and now now we have just with a big delayed effect. Um, I think as well though that the whipsawing there sort of makes it difficult for businesses to plan. I think that's why you've got a lot more businesses that are, are cautious about the outlook. Yes you've got high levels of net inward migration at the moment but like you say how long will that persist? Because the longer it persists the more people that are coming into the economy that get to spend that's good for general demand across all sorts of sectors um, but also adds of course to supply. So if you're in a business that's being uh, supply constrained and you're investing in that business, then maybe more people means actually more ability to do stuff. Um, But, and, and here's the rub, if, as I talked about before, job ads are starting to pull back and those hiring intentions are pulling back, people don't fly into New Zealand by the plane load, step off the plane and go, gosh, maybe I should get a job now. Most of them have got something lined up. Most of them have to for their visa conditions have something lined up. And so I think what you might see towards the second half of this year is less of those visas being approved, less of them being applied for because businesses don't need quite as many people. And that could see that net migration figure sort of pull back as sharply as it's gone up. That would still bring a lot more people people into the country uh, and sort of see a big shift again from negative 20,000 more people leaving the country but I think in general it is one of those things where uh, on the economic side it adds to both supply and demand so it probably adds a little bit more to the latent levels of how much spending might be going on uh, but also for some sectors gives them a lot more skills to do stuff with. Yes as as Adrian also memorably put it that we're tightening our belts but there are more belts. Correct Uh, I think it's interesting as well where that sort of focus is coming from you see a a much greater level of uh, inward migration on the likes of the construction side and we were just talking about infrastructure um, also on the likes of health and hospitality so those are areas that again have probably a little bit more uh, supply coming into them after a time when they have been constrained and there has been difficulties so I think interesting to see how the sort of sector by sector industry by industry dynamic plays out as well. There's just one last set of questions around uh, global trade opportunities um, we're seeing a number of things happening all at once it seems to me we've got uh, tension between the United States and China, which is becoming, you know, if you live in America, you think you're at war, but apparently, uh, which is drawing us towards American capital, American technologies, or, Euro- or Western technologies. Um, we're also seeing Chinese consumers starting to be much more patriotic about what they want to, want to eat and buy and consume. Um, are you starting to see anything in the in the numbers or in where investment is occurring, which tends to reflect that in terms of where New Zealand's uh, growth trajectory uh, looks to be going. 
I think it's interesting on the trade front. I mean, obviously, China is hugely important to New Zealand's uh, economic activities. You know, a third of all of our goods trade goes over there. Um, increasingly, we're seeing that the tourism market as well is, is pretty important. Chinese visitors are starting to come back. They're sort of the last cab off the rank, and that's starting to add a lot. I think the difficulty is where that demand goes as uh, the global economy starts to slow down. So, you know, we're already seeing, for example, forestry uh, exports haven't been performing as well. Log prices have fallen. Uh, the Chinese property market hasn't been as strong. You look at dairy as well, also pulling back into a, into a slightly softer position. Uh, meat's doing all right, but but again, more challenged. Horticulture, um, you know, you look at the likes of kiwi fruit and what have you. Quality issues had been uh, coming through. They're now improving. Uh, big frost last year, again, though, making it difficult. So I feel like, again, there's a bit more restraint in that trade front. Um, certainly geopolitically, I think we're seeing a lot more... Uh, uh, across the world of trying to figure out how to have as many friends in the sandpit as possible and I, I mean I talk about that a lot I think that it's important um, as a country you know when you go to school uh, you have a best friend that you play with every day but when they're sick you have a pretty miserable day because there's no one else to play with if you've got lots of friends in the, in, in the sandpit then actually your, your day is pretty good no matter sort of who's going hot or cold and I think increasingly for uh, New Zealand for trade in general we're moving away from just doing free trade agreements to sort of what are the other opportunities are there how do we break down on uh, tariff barriers and all that boring sort of stuff but what it means is that how are we getting New Zealand products and similar into other parts of the world? How are we ensuring that there are those stronger connections? Um, I think that's something we'll have to continue working on, sort of narrowly walking that tightrope between the geopolitical tensions and the economic and trade uh, opportunities, because there is a lot out there, but increasingly we're thinking a lot more about climate change, we're thinking a lot more um, about human rights and, and, and sort of you know slavery, modern slavery and, and what have you. Um, so I think people have got to do probably a little bit more research, and there's more of a focus for businesses to talk about what they're doing in those spaces Spaces to make it very clear what your point of differentiation um, is. But generally on that trade front, I mean, there is a lot of rising um, tension, I think, certainly for New Zealand. Um, we, we, we're a small trading nation at the bottom of the South Pacific. We have to sort of interact with the world. I think we could do a lot more with Australia as our, our nearby cousins and neighbours to project something a bit more Australasian to the rest of the world rather than sort of just competing for the, uh, you know, the, the Bledisloe Cup internally, uh, but to the rest of, of, of the world as well. Um, I don't think we're going to be the sort of place that ever dictates policy. We're, we're just too small. But I think we can be seen as sort of a, a level-headed straight shooter in that space that means that uh, we're focused on trying to keep things uh, at, a, at a diplomatic, cooler period rather than, like you say, getting things into that hot space where everyone feels like they're just minutes away from war. Sure. So you know, we're in a troubled world. We're in, a, in a, a, a mild recession in New Zealand. A lot of things for for the uh, retail investor to to try to navigate by comparison with the relative sort of endless bull market of the mid 2010s. If there was a, a, a one takeaway for for that person, for that person who's thinking about where do I put my money. What is it from what we just discussed today? I think a big one is is you can focus a lot on on sentiment and expectation and, and, and similar, but actually looking at how people are responding and, and real time or as close to is important. So the likes of that sort of uh, looking at what consumers are doing day to day, what are they buying or what aren't they buying? Uh, what are businesses willing to invest in? You know, who is raising capital, who is not? Who's willing to go out to the market with good results and, and who is not? I think gives you a, a much clearer steer now um, than sort of a lot of the other broad order economic trends. I mean, balance of payments and, and, and the trade deficit and similar um, might well be interesting, but I think for day-to-day -day investors, when they're thinking about where they're putting their money, they're going to want to understand where is that potential for the business that I'm looking to invest in, you know, are, are there particular trends or industries, and increasingly you are starting to see that come through. Where are put, people putting their money? Because there's a lot of talk that goes on, but if you're willing to put your money behind it, that seems to be a stronger trend at the moment. So stop guessing, start watching. Basically. <laughs> It's not a bad, not bad advice at all. Well, thanks, Brad, and thanks for tuning in, everybody. If you listen on Apple or Spotify, we'd love you to give us a rating, a quick rating and review. Uh, these really help more people to hear about this podcast and learn about growing their wealth over the long term. Also, uh, if you're keen, we have a special offer for Sharesies investors from Business Desk. If you use the promo code Shared Lunch 2023, all one word, you'll get $100 off an annual subscription to Business Desk, which is usually $249, including GST. The, the offer only applies to new Business Desk subscribers, can only be used once per subscriber, and can't be used with any other offer. Enjoy the rest of your week. Hey.